tonight on CBC Vancouver News. They weren't within kind of the COVID guidelines. COVID hot zone. The BC region where ignoring the rules is causing the biggest surge in new cases. Also. You know, like I'm not, I don't want anyone to feel sorry, but I mean, this is just not fair. With her dead son's claim stalled for three years, a heartbroken mother sues ICBC and. Restore confidence, rebuild BC. And we are doubling down on health care. Housing is a human right. The final push to get your vote as BC's pandemic election campaign wraps up. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. In many ways, this is one of the bleakest days BC has seen since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight, active cases are higher than they've ever been. And health officials are confirming more than 200 new cases for the third straight day. As Dr. Bonnie Henry renews her call for British Columbians to take a step back from their social lives. The BC CDC's latest positivity rate for cases is the highest it's been for more than six weeks at 3.1%. Active cases are above 2,000 for the first time. Fortunately, there have been no new deaths, but 75 people are in hospital, 24 in intensive care. There have also been two new outbreaks at health care facilities and two new community outbreaks. Once again today, a big chunk of those new cases are in one area of the province, more than 60% in fact. And it's no secret why. Health officials say weddings, funerals and large social gatherings in the Fraser Health region are driving up the numbers. That region includes Surrey and Abbotsford. As John Hernandez reports, it could mean tighter restrictions are coming. An empty hall is not a sight to behold, especially for event planners like Maureen Brown. It's just been uh, a lot of um, kind of very quiet days. Even with banquet halls shut down and limits on large gatherings, Brown says she still gets plenty of calls from eager couples, some with big plans. I have had to turn down a number of them as well, just because they weren't within kind of the COVID guidelines. They wanted something that was a little bit more grand or different setups that we couldn't handle. And she fears if there's a will, there's a way. It's the unsanctioned events that are in the backyard, that are in somebody's barn, that the tables are close together and the bar is going all night. COVID-19 cases in BC are surging, 703 days, the bulk of them in the Fraser Valley. Health officials are now considering even tighter restrictions on gatherings. We will use all the tools that are available, whether that is conditions tied to wedding licenses, restrictions on numbers in indoor gatherings. Among recent exposures, a two-day wedding that spanned locations in both Mission and Port Moody. Cases are also being linked to a slew of other events. Private parties, birthdays, gender reveal or funeral types of gatherings, or sometimes they're linked to then to workplaces. In a region where there's already more cases, then it's even more risky to do those activities and take those risks than it is in an area that has hardly any cases. Infectious disease experts say transmission can happen anywhere, but weddings can be especially risky. Weddings are a place where people eat and drink and dine together indoors and they congregate together. Uh, some weddings are extended in time. An industry like many on the brink that could be hit even harder if people continue to ignore the rules. We have almost no work, and the almost no work we have will be entirely gone. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. And Interior Health is now confirming 11 cases after announcing an outbreak earlier this week. That's six more after yesterday's update. 160 students and staff at Colonna's École de Lens au Sable are self-isolating. With so many people in quarantine, the district superintendent says the school may have to shut down due to lack of staff. And the federal government is committing more than $200 million to help bolster Canada's response to the pandemic. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has announced Ottawa will use the money to support several Made in Canada vaccine projects with some of the funding landing in our province. Our government is providing up to $173 million for Medicago to advance their vaccine candidate and create a production facility in Quebec City. 
We have also reached an agreement with them to supply up to 76 million doses of their vaccine. This is about securing potential vaccines for Canadians while supporting good jobs in research. Ottawa is providing more than $18 million to support a Vancouver company. $23 million will be spent on the development of six other vaccine candidates. Well, first they lost their son in what police say was a targeted shooting. Now they're embroiled in a messy fight with ICBC over his vehicle. A Surrey woman says three years of trying to reach a settlement for the stolen truck has cost her and her husband thousands of dollars. As Bell Puri of CBC's Impact Team reports, the dispute is now heading to court. It's been piling up for three years, the paperwork and the stress. I mean, this is just not fair. Marina Sokolovska is in a fight with ICBC over her son's truck that was stolen in October 2017. When it was found, the year-old Dodge Ram 1500 was heavily damaged. All electronics and everything was, like, taken out. A month into the claim process, ICBC told the repair shop operator to stop work on the truck. It was ice rain, it was snow, it was, it was horrible, cold. He goes, we uh, took the truck already apart, it's sitting getting rotten in our yard, and ICBC put a stop on the repairs. There was no explanation why. A few weeks later, another twist. Her son, 24-year-old Alexander Blaneru, was killed in what police say was a targeted shooting. Now, as administrator of his estate, Sokolovska inherited the ICBC claim. They wouldn't talk to me. They wanted to speak to Alex. So I had to explain to him that he is not alive anymore. And then... So they asked me to provide the, the papers that, you know, I'm allowed to talk on his behalf. So, of course, I didn't have these papers because his death was not planned. It's been three years since the $60,000 truck was stolen. And since Blanaru's parents co-signed for it when he bought it, they still make almost $800 in monthly payments for it, even though the truck is sitting dismantled in an ICBC yard. The family maintains the corporation did nothing about the claim until this summer when it offered to fix the truck with used parts. If they wanted to repair it, why they didn't repair it three years ago when the truck was still worth something that we can sell it and maybe use, you know, the money to pay it out. ICBC refused to comment. In court documents, it denies the stolen truck was insured. Papers shared by the family with CBC indicate otherwise, that there was insurance valid until weeks after the vehicle was recovered. Dig deep, ICBC. This is a family that has a major loss, and now you want to continue piling this on. Sokolovska and ICBC are scheduled to go to trial next month. Belpuri, CBC News, Surrey. One person has been arrested after that massive fire tore through several buildings on Main Street in Vancouver yesterday morning. As Joel Ballard reports, one business owner is vowing to reopen. He's just not sure when. Michel Blais was out shopping when his phone began to ring. A few people call me and say, hey, you're on fire, you're on fire. And I thought they were joking. But they weren't. His shop was up in flames. Blais is the owner of Frenchies, a popular diner on Main Street near Broadway. The building and his restaurant are now rubble. I saw the black smoke from Kingsway. I saw that. And then I kind of freaked out and, you know, I was basically uh, taking care about my staff, that's all. And I was more worried about my staff uh, losing their job. For 20 years, he built up the restaurant. The staff became his family, the customers, his community. And in hours, it all came crashing down. Along with Frenchies, several other shops were destroyed, including the Dandelion Emporium. The fire spread along the roof. As firefighters hosed it down, the shop stock was flooded. But thanks to help from other stores like Pulp Fiction Books, some of the inventory was saved. We were moving their stock out of their structurally compromised building as quickly as we could. But in the time that we were removing it, the ceiling was actually starting to, you know, dish in and finally fire and rescue was like yeah that's it everybody out. Brayshaw's store wasn't damaged 
And he's not surprised people are banding together. In this neighborhood, historically, there has been a real sense of an actual community and of individuals kind of coming together, helping one another out and looking out for one another. It's not clear exactly how the fire started, but police did arrest one person for suspected arson. That suspect has been released on a court date, and our investigators continue to investigate. Blair says his wife wants him to retire now. He says it's not an option. So I have to I have my staff back, that's all. Like I say, it's like a family to me, and, uh, you know, if you reopen, we don't make much money, that's fine. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, after weeks of campaigning, tomorrow is officially election day, and that has political leaders out and about hammering home their platforms and reminding people to cast their ballots. NDP leader John Horgan spent some of the day in New Westminster supporting candidates there. Horgan says his party's main focus is getting B.C. through the pandemic by investing heavily in health care. Polls suggest the NDP is ahead, but Horgan says British Columbians need to cast their ballots. I'd love to see a very high voter turnout. This is a critically important election. We are in a, a, in a, a time none of us have ever experienced before, and hopefully we will never have to experience again. But uh, polls are wonderful. Elections are what count. Uh, we can stack up polls all day long, but it's, uh, the only one that matters is tomorrow. Meanwhile, Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson says he's feeling confident one day away from the vote. He says if elected, the party has big plans to rebuild our province. That will mean getting rid of the PSD for a year. That will mean getting rid of the small business income tax, supporting our tourism and hospitality businesses like the hotels here at Lonsdale Key. It will mean more affordable daycare. It will mean uh, tax credits for seniors so they can live in their own home as long as they want to. And Green Party leader Sonia Firstenau was out sign-waving on Vancouver Island. Firstenau repeated her promise to build a clean, innovative economy to help the province recover from the pandemic. She says the party is excited about the momentum it's building throughout B.C. We're working from a different place as B.C. Greens, uh, speaking honestly, focusing on a positive vision, and ensuring that we are giving an alternative to the kind of politics that is about power as opposed to being about service. She says she's very hopeful several ridings will turn green in tomorrow night's vote. Well, just over 24 hours to go until polling closes. The NDP nearly 14 points up in our CBC poll tracker. The party has averaged about 48 percent over the last three months, though the numbers have taken a dip since the debate, coinciding with a slight increase for the Green Party. The Liberals have seen slow but steady gains in that span. And Elections BC says voters are going to have to be patient. It might take weeks to find out the official results of the election after a record number of people cast their ballot in advance. Usually, 90% of all ballots cast in an election are counted on election night. In this election, it could be between 65 to 70% of all ballots will be counted and reported on election night, with the remainder perhaps 30 to 35 percent counted at final count. BC's chief electoral officer says Elections BC has received nearly half a million mail-in ballots. That's an increase of 7,200 percent over the last election in 2017. And about 680,000 people voted at advance polls. The final count won't start till November 6, 13 days after the election which is required currently under the Elections Act to prevent voter fraud. And CBC News will have full provincial election coverage. Mike and I are hosting Tanya and Justin, Stephen Quinn, the whole team's on board. That's happening tomorrow night. Our special begins at 7 o'clock. You can watch right here on TV, online, and listen on CBC Radio 1. We'll have reporters at the major campaign headquarters, expert analysis from, again, Tanya and Justin. Plus, our political panels will weigh in with their thoughts. So please join us tomorrow night. Vancouver police are asking for the public's help in identifying a suspect believed to be responsible for two recent sex assaults. 
In both cases, both women were able to get to a place of safety and call police. Thankfully, these women were physically uninjured, but the emotional and mental distress they have to endure is concerning. Both incidents happened near Main Street and East 41st Avenue. On October 16th, a man approached a woman from behind and groped her. The same thing happened to a second woman on October 19th. Police have released surveillance video of the suspect. He is described as five feet, five uh, inches, seven inches tall with an average build. In one incident, he was wearing a black hat, gray hooded sweatshirt, black shoes, and was carrying a large umbrella. In the other, he was wearing a distinctive royal blue umbro jacket. Well, two stolen fermenting tanks worth more than $40,000 have been found at two different local scrapyards. They suffered some damage after the theft, but their rightful owner says he's just glad the massive tanks weren't melted down before they were found. Boardwalk Breweries' Phil Sachs says one is in good shape, but the other might not be salvageable. He's working on getting his brewery back on track, while Coquitlam RCMP say they are honing in on suspects. Canadian Pacific Railway is facing major fines after an investigation into a deadly train derailment in 2019. Three workers were killed after the train's brakes failed and it ran down a steep mountain near Field, B.C. Federal regulators ordered CP to take action by the end of the week. But as Dave Seglins reports tonight, the families of those killed say more still needs to be done. It's one of Canada's steepest, most dangerous mountain passes. Almost two years ago, a two-kilometer-long freight train with failed brakes ran away and derailed, killing three crew. Last week, CP Rail held a memorial in Calgary, where families confronted the railway's CEO and demanded an independent police investigation. Family, these are for you. We all wrote CBC News has learned that regulators are taking some action. We've obtained a directive issued last month under Canada's Labour Code. It finds that CP failed to identify and assess the hazards of running trains down that mountain. CP denies it, but if they don't fix it, they could face fines of up to a million dollars. Drop in the bucket for those guys. This grieving mother says fines aren't enough and believes there's been criminal negligence by the railway. If there's been criminal malfeasance, I want criminal accountability. A fifth estate investigation earlier this year found a string of breakdowns leading up to the crash. The only police to look into it so far have been CP's own corporate police service, and they found no wrongdoing. Well, the Union for Canada's Rail Workers is now calling for the RCMP to step in, and this month the Union wrote to all members of Parliament and Canada's Attorney General. We're calling on the Government of Canada to abolish all forms of corporate policing. Uh, it is absurd that uh, Canadian Pacific should be able to criminally investigate itself. Uh, obviously, they will never find themselves guilty of anything. The RCMP is reviewing this case, but still hasn't decided whether to open an investigation. I think in two years on, I would really like to be at a place where I can accept that my boy is gone. I mean, answers could give us closure. We have been re-victimized for the last two years. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now, and I'm really excited for what I think you're going to show us, and now even more excited because I see the snow <laughs> behind you. I, Anita, I did this for you. Yes, oh, I you. considered actually uh, staying inside, but then I had to show you the North Shore <laughs> snow. It is just beautiful out there. The system has finally cleared. Uh, check it out if you can. It is admittedly really nice to see the snow down around uh, I'd say 800 meters and that's why where we saw it this morning let me take you through pictures from the snow earlier today uh, starting off with our local mountains we saw a good amount of snow for Cypress Seymour uh, up towards Whistler and of course Grouse uh, picking up uh, at least five to ten centimeters and we did see those wet flakes down as far as Burnaby Mountain for the SFU campus even out towards Heritage Mountain and Port Moody and parts of the North Shore early this morning morning before it changed over to cold rain. The highways, uh, a mess earlier today with a, a truck not putting its chains on, causing the Coquihalla to be closed at one point both ways. And then Kelowna, Kamloops and Penticton 
all seen the biggest snowfall on record in October with 10 to 20 centimeters. The higher amount up towards Kamloops uh, where that snow is still falling in some cases. Look at the temperatures in through Metro Vancouver right now. Just a six in through YVR. It definitely feels like there is a chill in the air right now. I've got to say taking you through the satellite and radar. The system is sinking to our south. So just a few flakes uh, lingering in through the southern interior. It is clearing out for everyone across the province and we are looking at a very cold but clear weekend. Uh, before I get to, uh, I'll talk about our full forecast later on, but I just wanted to show you the contrast across the country today. So while we're talking about some of the earliest snowfall we've seen here in BC, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, look at those temperatures. With wow. the Humidex tonight, it still feels like 25 degrees. So some extremes across the country today. I'm torn now. I love snow. I love hot weather. Man. Mm. Yeah. Right here in Vancouver, we're not getting either of it. So, all right, thanks, Johanna. And undoubtedly, there will be some excitement over those snow-capped mountains. Yeah, that's, where, that's where it belongs, on the mountains. Uh, but there might be some more cynical people among us annoyed with seeing winter-themed decor already in stores. Okay, this is too much. What? This video taken by our colleague Ian had a man saying, I believe inside a Costco today. 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 Although I say this is too much. I know, Mike, you come from a household that I think starts off pretty early with the Christmas decorations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's too early. Two months to go. Wow. <laughs> well, thanks to Ian for shooting that. Get him to turn his camera the next time. Better quality. Uh, just a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can also follow both of us and Johanna on Instagram and Twitter as well. New research is casting doubt on the use of blood plasma from recovered COVID-19 patients to treat those with active infections. Just ahead, why the findings aren't discouraging Canadian researchers from continuing their work. And thanks for staying with us during our commercial-free live stream tonight. Well, uh, of course, getting your first home is a very big step in anyone's life. It's an even bigger step for people with intellectual disabilities. Travis Kingdon introduces us to a woman in Alberton, Prince Edward Island, who was determined to make it work. Hello. This is Janet Charchuk's first apartment. It would be a big deal for anyone, but for her, it means even more. It's something she's been working towards for her entire life. That was my dream. I always wanted to be able to live on my own. Charchuk is 37 and has an intellectual disability. Up until 2010, she was living with her parents, but when she decided it was time to move out, there was no supportive housing in Alberton. And while those supports existed elsewhere, it was important to Charchuk that she stay in her community. My connections are really here. My mom and my dad, they live in Montrose. And if I were to move to Sherlock Town, I won't be able to see them as often. And I do have friends. Yeah. And then Alberton House came along. The facility, run by Community Inclusions, opened its doors in 2010. It provides transitional and long-term housing for islanders with intellectual disabilities. If they grew up here or if they want to live in Alberton or Larry or wherever for that matter, that uh, they should have that opportunity and not have to leave their community, you know, for housing. A number of self-advocates worked with Community Inclusion to build the home, including Janet Charchuk. She got Alberton Town Council to rezone the land that the home now sits on. I actually feel pretty proud. And at the same time, I also felt like I made a real difference for people. But Alberton House wasn't the final stop for Charchuk. After six years, she decided it was time to make her dream come true. So she went to a local apartment building and put an application in, which came as a surprise to her mother, who was out of province at the time. So I think from the very beginning, Janet always surprised us and amazed us. You know, I was a bit surprised, but when I thought about it, no, that just fits right in with what she's going <laughs> to <Yeah>. do. <laughs> 
Now that Janet Charchuk is living alone, she hopes her journey shows people two things. The first, that islanders with intellectual disabilities can live independently. They just need to take it slow and find somewhere that can offer them the required support first. And most importantly, that they have the right to choose where they live. Travis Kingdon, CBC News, Charlottetown. All right. Just a quick reminder, uh, tomorrow night is election night, voting day here in British Columbia. Full coverage begins on CBC British Columbia at uh, 7 o'clock tomorrow night on a number of different platforms. And when the polls close at 8 o'clock, those results trickling in, we'll have all of it for you uh, probably until about, I think, 11 o'clock at least, maybe later, depending yeah. on what's happening. It'll be interesting to see how it all uh, works out. CBC Radio online here and on CBC Television, of course. Back in Stick with us. We'll be back soon. Research is casting doubt on the use of blood plasma from recovered COVID-19 patients to treat those with active infections. But the findings aren't discouraging Canadian researchers taking part in an international plasma trial. The CBC's Vicodopia explains why. Convalescent plasma is extracted from the blood of patients who've recovered from the coronavirus. It's a way to transplant virus-fighting antibodies from one person to another. The procedure has long shown promise. Now an Indian clinical trial found it didn't work. It didn't reduce mortality or progression to severe disease. Normally it takes us a year this hematologist says the research had one critical flaw. If you just take people that come to you and say, oh, I had COVID-19, I've recovered, take my plasma, and then infuse it into other people with no testing, um, the vast majority of the plasma that you're going to collect isn't going to have neutralizing antibodies against the virus. Researchers like Callum and others working on their own plasma trials are learning antibodies created to fight the coronavirus don't last. So when the plasma is taken is critical. So you retain your, your immunity, but you don't have that really high level of antibodies that we need for therapeutic for other people. Convalescent plasma has been used experimentally since the 1918 flu pandemic without any conclusive evidence that it works. Canadian researchers hope to have that evidence one way or the other using plasma from more than a thousand carefully screened volunteers who've recovered from COVID-19. Yeah, and I donated once and they said that I had enough antibodies to become, uh, to donate a second time. So I did and I've been setting up appointments like that. Thank you, Mr. President. Even though all the evidence isn't in yet, that hasn't stopped the U.S. from temporarily approving plasma to treat COVID patients. They've given... 100,000 patients in the United States convalescent plasma. They could have answered this question many times over. Um, and here we are still, you know, nine months into this, and we still don't have an answer. Like so much about this pandemic, that answer can't come soon enough. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. U.S. presidential candidates Donald Trump and Joe Biden were back on the campaign trail today following last night's final debate. The race for the White House has now entered the home stretch. And as CBC's Rafi Bouchkanian reports, early voting continues in unprecedented numbers. From those who are on the ballot to everyday Americans. People should realize how extremely important it is to vote. This country's engaged in this election like never before. Nearly 50 million have already voted, breaking vote-by-mail records. <laughs> For the undecided and yet to vote, this may have been a turning point. Last night's final debate between the two presidential candidates, Donald Trump and Joe Biden clashed over several issues, including race in America. I am the least racist person in this room. He pours fuel on every single racist fire. This guy has a dog whistle about as big as a foghorn. And, of course, COVID-19. We're learning to live with it. 99% of people recover. 
We have to recover. We can't close up our nation. We're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. Today, the two were back on the campaign trail. COVID-19 dwarfs anything we've faced in recent history. And it isn't showing any signs of slowing down. Biden appearing virtually with plans to hit Pennsylvania tomorrow. Trump on his way to Florida this afternoon. 11 days from now, we're going to win the state of Florida. We're going to win four more years in the White House. Those two locations indicate both men know swing states will decide what happens less than two weeks from now. But the pandemic still looms over this election. More than 77,000 new cases reported yesterday alone, one of the highest daily numbers here yet. Rafi Bujikan, on CBC News, Washington. When we come back tonight, we're going to tee up the latest from the BC campaign trail and we'll look into why some results will take longer to confirm. Premier Dave Barrett's NDP government was decisively turned out of office yesterday by a British Columbia electorate that apparently opted to go back to the good old social credit values. Bill Bennett's coalition of social credit plus ex-liberals, ex-Tories and NDP sent the NDP forces reeling into shock and disbelief. The final count was Socred's 36, NDP 17 and only one seat each for the Liberals and the Conservatives. Each of those leaders was re-elected and no one else. It was jubilation at Bennett's headquarters in Kelowna last night as the returns came in, and the self-named free enterprisers rejoiced at turning away what they called the socialist hordes of the NDP. At one point, the Socreds booed their TV sets when Premier Barrett's face appeared in front of them. Bill Bennett, the new BC Premier, had to be the happiest man in Canada last night as he made his appearance before his people. It appears now from the election returns that we have elected a majority government. I congratulate those who worked so hard throughout this province to bring about this victory. We didn't try to win it with glib slogans. We won it with membership, with people, and with British Columbians. And with British Columbians, we will bring strong leadership back to this province. If Bill Bennett was the happiest man in B.C. last night, the second happiest man had to be his father, W.A.C. Bennett former premier who was defeated in 1972 by Mr. Barrett. For him, his son's victory was especially sweet. This is a great night for the people of British Columbia. A people's government is back in power once again. Everybody can breathe more easily tonight. Three and a half years in the wilderness for the people of British Columbia is too long. The, the people have, I said that they needed to put their finger in the hot stove and they'd feel it and they felt it. Tonight they've taken it away. The Liberals, never strong in BC, were slaughtered at the polls. They elected only one man, their leader, Gordon Gibson Jr. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We have almost no work, and the almost no work we have will be entirely gone. That's if Dr. Bonnie Henry brings in more rules tied to weddings and events. 
The threat comes after a surge in COVID-19 cases, particularly in the Fraser Valley. Today, another 223 cases, 65% of them in the Fraser Health region. Well, I was trying to call them, they wouldn't communicate with me. Like I have all these emails and then, you know, they would, I have like, I think like probably four or five adjusters already on this case. The parents of a slain Surrey man are suing ICBC. They say the Crown Corporation has allowed their insurance claim to linger nearly three years after the vehicle was stolen shortly before their son's death. The parents co-signed the original vehicle loan and with the ICBC claim outstanding are still making payments. And one person has been arrested after that fire destroyed a beloved Vancouver diner. The heavy smoke and flames engulf Frenchies at Main and Broadway. Three buildings and a family apartment above the restaurant have also been ruined. Well, many British Columbians cast their ballots for the provincial election in advance. Others will head to the polls tomorrow. The public has come to expect the declaration of a winner on election night. But as Greg Rasmussen shows us, the unprecedented pandemic vote means some results in this province may not be confirmed for weeks. Hoping for a bump at the ballot box, NDP leader John Horgan is running on his handling of the pandemic. COVID has turned our world upside down, but working together, following advice, following the science, British Columbia is leading the way in Canada. NDP promises include much greater spending on health care and a $1,000 COVID cash benefit for middle class families. <laughs> It's been a tougher road for the B.C. Liberals. Their leader has often been on the defensive due to controversial candidates. His big promise, temporarily axing the provincial sales tax. And that will mean getting rid of the PSD for a year. That will mean getting rid of the small business income tax, supporting our tourism and hospitality businesses. The Greens went into this election holding three seats and the balance of power. Their new leader is pushing for faster action on climate change and to start putting in place the building blocks for a clean economic recovery so that we can have a stronger, more sustainable province in the long term. At advanced polls this week, many were talking about the NDP forcing an election ahead of schedule. I'm not very happy that I, I'm having to, to vote right now. It's a little bit of a cynical move for the NDP government to call an election now. I think we need to uphold democracy even though there's a pandemic. <laughs> I definitely do not think that it was a good idea to have an election now. I think it was very selfish of the party in power. But will that matter at the ballot box? People in this in this context of the COVID crisis uh, are obviously making decisions about their economic future, how they feel, what makes them feel safe. Uh, and I think those are the issues that ultimately will decide the election. Finding out who wins may take more than two weeks. That's how long it's expected to process half a million mail-in ballots, votes that may end up deciding this election. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Safe to say this has been one of the most unusual elections in the history of British Columbia. And the polls open in less than 24 hours. Lots to talk about tonight as we gear up. Let's get straight into our political panel. Sat Harwood, BC Green Party Provincial Council. Nikki Hill, Chair and former Director of Organization for BC NDP and Brenner Buller, former Director of Policy to Premier Christy Clark. Welcome, all of you. Nikki, I want to start with you. The polls are showing a strong NDP lead. How much confidence does the party have going into tomorrow, or is this a case of don't get too far ahead, given the polls have been really wrong in a lot of recent elections? Yeah, it's a really great question, and where we are on election eve, and I think, you know, New Democrats are naturally cautious considering our 2013 election experience. Um, but polls are a great snapshot of where the voter sentiment is. And I think what's important in them is looking at those trends that show that people really consistently believe that John Horgan and the NDP are the ones who can create a stable government to lead us through the pandemic, through recovery. And so while we are always, you know, cautiously optimistic and looking at them, we also just don't take anything for granted as New Democrats. Uh, there is definitely a strong BC liberal trend still showing in the interior, in the north, and those are going to be things to watch as we actually see results starting tomorrow night. And Brenda, sticking with those polls, Andrew Wilkinson way down. Why wasn't Mr. Wilkinson able to get much traction? It was a snap election, but it wasn't a short campaign. Well, you got to remember, Anita, that uh, Mr. 
Premier John Horgan has been the Premier, has had the spotlight, and Andrew Wilkinson uh, just became leader uh, in 2018. So, and because of COVID, what one of the things that the BC Liberals did honorably was cooperate with uh, Premier John Horgan and uh, such as the Greens to allow them to uh, come together and um, allow the public officials to respond to the health crisis that we're in. And I think that's part of the reasons. But one thing that the BC Liberals needed to do was come up with bold ideas to uh, talk about economic recovery uh, post-COVID. And I think that's what they did. If you look at their reductions in taxes, their support for seniors, their supports for uh, childcare and the investments in infrastructure, I think people will see, you know, do you want to compare? Do you want uh, John Horgan's cynical attempt to grab power while people were worried about their health? Or do you want a bold plan uh, to continue BC uh, so we can get on with recovery? Okay, Sat, the Greens hoping to hold on to the party's three seats. How big of a blow is it if the Green Party doesn't do that? Well, yes, I mean, obviously that would be a significant blow. Um, but uh, I would say that we are quietly confident in terms of what we've been able to achieve this campaign. You know, we, uh, we had a leader who was in power for all of one week before the election was called. I think it's fair to say that we've run an excellent campaign. We've had two very good debates, a record amount of fundraising, lots of new members and supporters signed up. And so on balance, I think we've done everything that we need to do to, uh, to earn people's votes. And, and now, now things are going to be in their hands tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. But uh, we feel very optimistic about what we've been able to achieve. And I think the results will show tomorrow night. Given that we are just less than a day away from the election, final question for all of you. What's considered a good night? Brinder, let's start with you. <laughs> well, I'm never one for predictions, but uh, I think uh, this is, uh, as you mentioned, Anita, uh, an unusual election. And uh, I think the process uh, in itself is going to be a long one, given that we've asked thousands of British Columbians to mail in their ballots and we know that those are not going to be counted till 13 days uh, after the final uh, ballots are, uh, sorry uh, polls close on 8 p.m. so I think we have to respect that process and respect the fact that British Columbians have mailed in ballots and uh, and wait and we'll see ultimately uh, you know both parties have put out their platforms uh, I'm hoping people see that uh, BC Liberals have a bold vision to move ahead and uh, be chosen but uh, We'll, we'll see what the public says tomorrow, but I'm sure we're going to be in for some uh, surprises. Is there a magic number, though, the Liberals are hoping for? Uh, you always want to win. Majority. All right. Nikki, and what about you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's really tough to predict, particularly in BC elections. I, you know, I work nationally, and people always uh, look at us sort of... Uh, at the wild west of politics, you just never know where it's going to go. So obviously a majority is anyone's goal. Um, I think, you know, a, a good night is going to be um, seeing some of where some of those swing seats might be landing. I'm really curious to see what's happening out in the Fraser Valley, happening um, in seats that are currently held by liberals, which seem to be really, you know, demonstrating they might support the new Democrats. And you know, I think all of us are always hesitant to speculate this early on because it is the will of the voters to decide who they want to lead us through this next stage. But um, I think a good night is seeing a high voter participation and people out on that democratic process tomorrow. Well, in those key swing ridings, we know NDP and Liberals have both been battling it out in the Maple Ridges, Coquitlam, Burke Mountain. I also want to mention lots of talk of a majority 44 seats is the magic number to get that majority. Now, back to SAT, what is a good night for the Green Party? Well, you know, I mean, we've we've talked a lot during the campaign about uh, how we feel it would be good for voters to to return the NDP with a minority government as opposed to the majority they're seeking. I think Sonia's made that clear on a number of occasions. Uh, speaking for us personally, obviously, uh, we'd like to see Adam and Sonia win their seats. Uh, ideally, we'd like to pick up a few more ridings as well. I think also, too, for us, a lot of it is about maintaining the support that we have. And so uh, one of the things that we've traditionally the argument we've traditionally faced is, well, you've, you've got soft supporters, they, they could go either way. But I think really what this election has shown is that people are increasingly becoming comfortable with the BC Greens as their natural uh, prep political preference. And so we're seeing a real solidification of votes at a much higher percentage than we've traditionally had over the preceding decades. And so I think from our perspective, uh, the trend lines for this election are really positive for us, and I think they'll be positive going forward as well.
Lots of positivity to, to, for right now, I like it. Um, good luck to all of you and we'll talk to you tomorrow night. These three are our panelists on our special BC election coverage as well. Thank you. Thank you. you. And you can tune in on all platforms to our election coverage tomorrow. Yes, our special begins at seven o'clock. We're gonna be on TV, CBC Radio One and however you watch this show online. We'll have reporters at the major campaign headquarters along with expert analysis from Tanya Fletcher and Justin McElroy. Again, coverage begins an hour before polls close at eight. 16 minutes in front of seven o'clock. Shot of the Port of Vancouver on this Friday evening. A soggy day on the south coast, but a dusting of snow on our local mountains and Johanna says conditions will be improving for the weekend. Her forecast coming next. The Market Report is brought to you by Fortis BC. We've got even bigger rebates. Rebate. Whoa. On select high efficiency equipment for business, but only for a limited time.
on the pandemic has claimed another retail casualty. After 60 years in business, Le Chateau has announced it is seeking court protection from creditors. The Montreal-based fashion chain will be closing its 123 locations across Canada. 1,400 employees will be losing their jobs. Many people lamenting the loss of uh, Le Chateau today. Uh, Anita is, uh, in fact, wearing an item. I fished out an oh. old Le Chateau skirt to wear in honor of the retail chain. Oh, uh, yeah. Saturdays. I respect that, Anita. I respect yeah. that, yeah. I mean, it's really a loss of my youth as well. That was my prom dress, my goth phase. Oh, about yeah. About eight <laughs> pairs of black, huge flares. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a, it's end of an era, isn't it? It, it really sure is. is, yeah. Anyway, <sighs> Le Chateau, okay. unfortunate. Uh, Joe yeah. is here, as you can see, with uh, the forecast. Uh, we saw that snow up on the North Shore Mountains. Uh, not much, but a bit of snow up on the North Shore Mountains uh, in behind you earlier. And uh, what's the weekend looking like? Cold and clear. So uh, it's definitely going to feel like a, a different season as we head into the weekend. Winter is not... Uh, on us for good, uh, although long range models are hinting at a cold and snowy long range winter, but we are going to get up to seasonal. Uh, let me take you through the forecast. We've got a few things to talk about, starting with uh, the satellite and radar. Um, let me just see if I can get this going again. You know what? I might have lost my graphics, um, but that is accurate. You are seeing that snow falling uh, just east of Kamloops, where we are still looking at a couple of centimeters. Uh, the snowfall warnings, I think, have just ended for the southern interior, and we're going to see everyone clear out as we head into the long-range forecast. Uh, the cool air will descend upon basically all of British Columbia, looking for everyone to drop down about 10 degrees below seasonal. Uh, as we head into early next week, we'll remain well below seasonal and uh, sunny for Saturday and Sunday. I tried very hard to get my graphics back up, but uh, <laughs> I really hope that you took in that radar east of Kamloops. Uh, there will be a pop quiz on exactly <laughs> where the boundaries of that cell are. All you need to know is it is going to be a cold, but beautifully a blue sky weekend. Temperatures overnight getting close to the freezing mark tomorrow morning, and then again Sunday morning. Uh, we are gonna be waking up to some wind chills, and there's a bit of an outflow uh, behind that system. So uh, areas, in an inlet, could be looking at some gusty winds each morning, but enjoy a crisp and clear one. Anita, I feel like this is exactly what uh, the kind of weekend that you love. My fingers are crossed for some flakes. <laughs> no guarantees there. <laughs> Thanks, Joanna. Well, after the break, meet the 96-year-old crushing it at CrossFit. We rarely see images of black, uh, non-binary and trans folks when we are walking through the cityscape. And this project interrupts that and celebrates them 10 feet tall, uh, right in the middle of the downtown core. How did you decide who to photograph and where to do it? I was uh, really interested in showing a variety of different trans experiences. They're such a varied experience. So I talked to Chris, Raven, and Monica. I was also very drawn to them because they're activists and they have been involved in shaping a lot of uh, trans activism in the city. How does it feel to see your work in a place that gets so much traffic? As a black trans person myself, it's so exciting to see us, you know, large and in charge right in the middle of public space. One of the things that I heard from a lot of trans people was that they didn't feel safe in public space in broad daylight because there were so many people and so many interactions of transphobia that they experienced on the day to day. And they often felt safer at night when there was less people. So at night, these orbs glow and it makes my heart sing to think that a trans person who's walking maybe in the wee hours would come upon this and 
see themselves reflected. We know that spaces like these are contested spaces. There are often places where people live when they don't have housing. There are often places where people gather when they don't have other places to go. These are, are spaces that are used for public space by a lot of different people in a lot of different ways. And I hope that these beacons sort of light up a space that is heavily trafficked by a lot of folks who are really marginalized in the community. What are some of the conversations you hope people have when they see your exhibit? I think it's not an everyday experience for people to encounter trans people uh, in their daily commute. I hope that this makes people stop and think about who we are actually thinking of when we're imagining our city. Who are the Torontonians that we're talking about? You know, recognizing the vast contributions that trans people have made to the cityscape. I think I hope that people come away from this and they want to find out more about trans people who are shaping their city. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Don't miss the Vancouver Asian Film Festival, a celebration of diversity in film and the Asian diaspora. This year, enjoy the festival in the comfort of your home. Get tickets at VAFF.org. And Hutzpah Festival of International Doing Performing Arts returns this November with an exciting lineup of performances and stimulating conversation. Learn more at hutzpahfestival.com. And for more, check us out at cbc.ca slash bc. Well, I think it's fair to say this year has already been unlike any other. And now here's one more small but strange thing to tell you about, though at least this one is cute. Yeah. You're looking at a litter of puppies from a farm in Italy. And yes, look at ah. that one. It is green. All the other puppies <laughs> and their mom have white fur. Oh that seems this uh, little guy, appropriately named Pistachio, Came into contact with a green pigment in the womb, but his bizarre fur color won't last, apparently. The green will slowly fade to white over the next few weeks. What a cutie, though. Say it isn't, it ain't easy being green. Is that what they say? Is that what they say? It's not uh, long standing for that little guy. Well, for some of us, a birthday is the perfect excuse to tuck into cake. But one PEI man celebrated his special day by hitting the gym. Yes, and we should mention he is 96 years old. While Bill Mason may be new to CrossFit training, his discipline and dedication is now inspiring the regulars. Take a look. I never heard of CrossFit before very recently. I have the need of something to do that is occupies my time and is interesting and that I can do and uh, this seemed uh, like a possible fit. Bill's a great guy. He came to us about a little over a month ago. Uh, his son had been training with us for a while and uh, he'd asked about his dad who was nine. You know, almost 96, doing the primetime class, which is our class for some of our older members. And I said, sure, come on in. I had a little stroke, actually, a couple of years ago, and that left me very wobbly. And I uh, figured out, finally, that part of the wobbliness was that I was very weak. We've actually seen pretty significant progress with him. He has, you know, been using his cane a lot less, even through the workouts. Uh, where he used to uh, have to hold on to a post and you know do any kind of dumbbell work now he's just standing 
free and clear of it and doing that. A lot of these people are very much like me. They're not so different in age, and they all uh, handle themselves very well, uh, which uh, gives me hope that I might uh, handle myself as well as they do someday. One of our members was 70. She goes, oh my gosh, he's like 26 years older than me. And for all the rest of us, we can look at that. And I'm like, I just turned 52. And I look at him and say, OK, well, I've got 44 more years in me when you look at someone like that, hopefully. And how do you feel when you finish a workout? Relieved and <laughs> pleased, R ready for a rest. <laughs> That's how we all feel. Pretty good for 96, yeah. OK, uh, that's just about it uh, for us tonight, but we're going to see you in just over 24 hours from now for our provincial election coverage. Mike and I will be here along with the early editions Stephen Quinn and BC Today's Michelle Elliott. Our special begins at 7 o'clock. You can watch on TV, online, or listen on CBC Radio 1. And we'll have reporters at the major campaign headquarters, expert analysis with Tanya Fletcher and Justice McElroy, plus our political panels will weigh in with their thoughts. We leave you tonight with your election weekend forecast. Courtesy of meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. Clear and cold for the weekend. Looks like a good one. Election weekend in British Columbia. We will see you again tomorrow night starting at 7.